Doom 3 released in 2004 and at the time represented a massive step forward in graphics technology. Its id Tech 4 engine, once again developed by John Carmack, would show off a brand new dynamic per pixel lighting system, which is new technology in games that gave lights a more realistic appearance and shadows that allowed lights to cast even on non-static objects such as monsters and machinery. id Tech 4 would also include normal mapping and specular highlighting. The end result of this technology, including the new complex animation system and scripting system, would be a horror-style action game that stood out above the rest. In 2004, this was a technical showcase, and in many ways before its time, and the game itself would feature a great story, atmospheric sound and gameplay, and this was just the icing on the cake. In the end, Doom 3 was a very, very successful game, selling 3.5 million copies on the PC, and an 87 Metacritic score. Doom 3 would also win multiple awards for its graphical technology. But all this would come at a cost. You would need a fairly beefy PC to run Doom 3 at all with decent frame rates. The minimum specification on the original Doom 3 box requires a Pentium 4 or Athlon CPU running at 1.5 gigahertz with 384 megabytes of RAM, 2.2 gigabytes of hard drive space, and a fast DirectX 9 compatible graphics card. This would let you get away with running the game at 640x480 at maybe 15 frames per second. I remember back in the day when I had my PC, I could never run Doom 3 very well. It simply beat up my poor G43 graphics card and in the end I switched over to Half-Life 2 which ran much better. It was one of those games that defined the term PC Master Race, with people building a PC just to play the game. And if you had the cash, it was an amazing experience. But many people didn't, and this was the age before multi-core CPUs where a single-core Pentium 4 could reach very high frequencies. In 2005, Doom 3 would find its way to the console for the very first time with the original Xbox. And for all intents and purposes, the OG Xbox port of Doom 3 is excellent, with almost everything brought across from the PC. It also had an added bonus of up to 4-player co-op mode over System Link or Xbox Live. And for me personally, the original Xbox version ran better than the PC that I had at the time. The Xbox version runs at 640x480. The frame rate targets 30fps, and for the most part, it gets there. Of course, the game will slow down during some of the more intense battles. But for the most part, it runs great. There's also Dolby 5.1 surround sound, and finally, the game does really take advantage of the Xbox controller with some very clever button mappings in place. But let's stop there for a second. Doom 3 on the PC, as we said, required a minimum of 384 megabytes of RAM and a 1.5 gigahertz CPU and a DX9 capable card. The OG Xbox, on the other hand, runs a 733 megahertz processor, only 64 megabytes of RAM, which I might add is universally shared. In other words, there is no dedicated GPU RAM. It takes a portion of the 64 megabytes itself. The original Xbox version was developed by Vicarious Visions who already had experience porting Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast to both the GameCube and the original Xbox back in 2002. But Doom 3 would not just be a simple port. Karthik Bala, the founder and CEO of Vicarious Visions in 2004, said, just to provide some clarification off the top, Doom 3 for Xbox is really another version of Vids Newest title rather than a port. We're in simultaneous development with id, and although the game will appear on PC slightly before it does on the Xbox, Doom 3 will represent more of a multi-platform launch than a typical port. So exactly how do you port Doom 3 to the original Xbox that has much lower specifications than the minimum hardware requirements? Well, as always, it comes down to clever programming, taking advantage of the target hardware that you have, and of course, optimization. For this, I reached out to Brian Osman, who at the time worked as a senior programmer for Vicarious Visions on the original Doom 3 port for the OG Xbox to get a better understanding. Vicarious Visions had experience in bringing id Tech 3 games to console with their port of Jedi Knight 2, and were prototyping more demanding id Tech 3 titles. id Tech 4, of course, would be a completely different thing, more demanding and more resource intensive. However, according to Brian, although Doom 3 was incredibly intensive and demanding, it was also very well aligned with the Nvidia graphics chip found in the OG Xbox, the NV2A. The NV2A was a custom NVIDIA graphics chip that for the first time in hardware consoles offered both fixed and more importantly, programmable vertex and pixel shaders. It would allow tasks to be assigned to the GPU that traditionally were handled by the CPU. 
pixels are stored as a set of shared registers and then cycled through up to eight possible combiner stages with each stage applying its own arithmetic operations. And this programmability and hardware capabilities of the NV2A lined up very well with Doom 3. Doom 3 would render one pass per light and on the original Xbox, a complex pixel shader program wasn't necessary. In fact, on the OG Xbox, Doom 3 uses a single pass pixel shader program that took advantage of the eight combiner stages plus a fog stage. This approach would then take care of all the lighting and normal mapping in the game. PC Doom 3 has heavy use of lighting and on the Xbox, lights would be reduced in order to keep performance where it needed to be. If you side by side the same scene, PC on one side and Xbox on the other, the reduction in lighting is apparent. But the biggest optimizations would come by taking advantage of the Xbox GPU. On PC Doom 3, all character skinning was performed by the CPU. It didn't do any vertex shading on the models at all. And according to Brian, this was done on the PC to have exact polygon hit detection for the enemies. More impressively, if you shot an enemy, blood decals would project through space and decal wrap around the geometry of the level, including the character models themselves. For the character models, this was simply not possible with the amount of processing that the Xbox CPU has. To compensate, Brian replaced the hit detection with a more rudimentary bounding box collision approach. Most people that play Doom 3 on the OG Xbox wouldn't even notice this, and in the end, it was good enough. To solve for the blood decals on the character models, Brian would use a second layer of vertices that were mapped over the whole model that would determine how much blood needed to be visible and increment as the enemies were shot. Offloading these very processor intensive and important tasks to the GPU would be the order of the day. Another roadblock was that like id Tech 3, id Tech 4 used OpenGL in its back end. And of course, the original Xbox didn't have any support for OpenGL at all. But as mentioned, Vicarious Visions already had experience with id Tech 3 and OpenGL. Initially, an OpenGL to Direct 3D wrapper was used. However, during development, this was scaled back and the game would use a native Direct 3D backend to squeeze as much performance out of the hardware as possible. A very important aspect of the original Xbox port that the competition, notably the GameCube and PS2, didn't have at least out of the box was the built-in storage. Recall that the Xbox has 8GB built in. The hard drive would be crucial for Doom 3 to run on the original Xbox. In my experience, many developers used this space as some type of virtual memory swap space to get around the 64MB limitation. However, according to Brian, the Xbox port of Doom 3 uses the hard drive as a texture streamer that has a custom algorithm to predict which textures need to be pulled in as necessary. He also let me know that if a texture was missing, it would just render black which being Doom 3 worked out fine because, as you know, much of the game is in darkness anyway. Much of Doom 3's file formats over on the PC were in plain ASCII. Additional optimizations were also done to convert all scripting and map data to compressed binary files. This would significantly help with loading performance and reduce memory usage. Vicarious Visions would also take the fairly complex keyboard controls of the PC version and map them across to the Xbox controller. And this took the form of D-pad shortcuts for weapons, as well as implementing a Halo-style control scheme. Having prior experience on bringing id Tech 3 titles to console meant that VV had a very good understanding of how to get it right. And you know what? They absolutely nailed it. But all this still doesn't really answer the question. How did they fit Doom 3 in less than 64 megabytes of memory? The initial approach was to build a small vertical slice or proof of concept that stripped out everything other than running the game with a tiny map that would use a small amount of memory and fail gracefully. From there, the approach was to carefully add systems back into the game one at a time, performing an optimization pass on each system, reducing memory allocation for unneeded resources. They would also budget out resources by comparing each level to the PC version and determine if any reductions were necessary to fit the game into memory. In the scenario where a particular map was too large to fit into memory even with these specific reductions, then sacrifices had to be made. For example, enemies may have been scaled back or a hallway or section of the map was cut or lights were removed in order to free up resources. In some situations, the map was still far too large to fit into Xbox RAM. And in this scenario, the map was simply split into two smaller subsections. One interesting side effect of the aggressive memory optimizations that were done left Doom 3 in a state where if you played the game long enough in one sitting, it would crash with a dirty disk error. 
According to Brian, the texture streamer in the Xbox port of Doom 3 would slowly fragment memory as you played. It was fine for a couple of hours, but if you played more than like 60% of the game in one sitting, crash. Rather than take the blame, we put up the dirty or unreadable disk error. But this issue aside, it's these performance and memory optimizations and VV's experience in console ports from the PC that would ultimately get the job done. The original Xbox at the time was probably the only console that could pull off Doom 3. VV were experienced enough working with id Tech 3 to know that they could pull it off. According to Karthik Bala, with only 64 megabytes of RAM on the Xbox and a 733 MHz processor, we knew that it would be quite challenging, but not impossible. The team here was really excited to be working on a project, a chance to work on Doom. The icing on the cake would be the exclusive co-op mode that was added to the game as well. And guess what? You can still play Doom 3 on Xbox Live today via Insignia, a modern day Xbox Live replacement that works fantastic. I was playing Doom 3 co-op over the weekend with my good friend Libby and the experience was fantastic. If you want to learn more about Insignia, I'll leave links in the description below. So, is Doom 3 considered an impossible port? In many ways it is, but with the right team, with the right technical knowledge, and of course the Xbox hardware at the time, rather than impossible, I would consider it more of a controlled risk. VV had a very good idea that Doom 3 was definitely possible, and they were able to execute on it, by masterfully crafting an amazing experience and an amazing port. I definitely recommend you check out Doom 3 on the original Xbox if you're a fan of either Doom 3 or the Xbox, and I think that this is one of the best ports ever made. It's one of those games that I've desperately wanted to learn more about, and I'm very, very happy that I had the chance. And I do want to thank Brian Osman for taking his time out for answering all my questions about Doom 3 on the OG Xbox, especially since it was many, many years ago. So with that, we're going to leave it here. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this episode, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye for now.